Hi everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, I understand there are participants from across the globe uh, for this webinar. Uh, thank you for joining in. Uh, I would uh, be discussing the topic of uh, domestic transfer pricing in India, which is a recent development uh, applicable uh, for the financial year ended 31st March 2013. Uh, in case uh, you need any assistance uh, during the call or if you have any questions, uh, you could use the WebEx feature of Q&A and post your question there. Uh, and I'll try and take them up uh, as I speak or uh, towards the end of the discussion. The agenda uh, has been organized for today's discussion uh, across just providing a backdrop to the transfer pricing regime in India, some of the legislative uh, provisions and how uh, it triggers the compliances for domestic transfer pricing, looking at uh, the agenda of transfer pricing from a tax management perspective, uh, especially for uh, tax uh, heads in the industry, uh, what is the proposed approach we recommend in looking at the analysis? And uh, we run through some impact assessment issues in terms of illustrations on uh, what could be some of the common transactions and fact patterns uh, which would be impacted. And uh, with a concluding slide on how we can take this further. So transfer pricing as a topic uh, in India has been in existence uh, since April, two th uh, uh, April 2002, 2001. And uh, there has been, uh, it's been rated as one of the top uh, tax issues in the Indian context. Uh, it, uh, the regulations which have been introduced now is with respect to the domestic transactions, and they are effective April 2012. The regulations require the taxpayer to substantiate the intra-group flow of services, complies with the arms length standard. Uh, what we would like to emphasize on that while it is a tax anti-avoidance regulation, the concept of transfer pricing is really bo borrowed from economics and can also be adopted successfully in management. It is surely a subjective concept. And uh, given the subjectivity, we have seen how the Indian tax authorities have gone about the cross-border situation and in the cross-border world, uh, Indian transfer pricing authorities have uh, done an adjustment as large as 91,000 crores of Indian rupees uh, with a tax impact of 30,000 crores. Uh, the Indian tax authorities have surely uh, you know, evolved over this period of time and through the audit cycles ga gathered significant experience in the area of transfer pricing. Uh, they, have, uh, they have been rated as one of the toughest authorities, and I must acknowledge that their knowledge on the subject and some of the approaches they have adopted is, uh, is truly commendable. Uh, there could be, obviously, issues, and uh, with uh, uh, taxpayers requiring to pay higher taxes, it's, obvi it's obviously not a good feel. Uh, having said that, at least as a concept, uh, this has been um, well, uh, you know, train, the training for the tax authorities have been quite strong, and the approach is obviously evolving uh, based on some robust principles. <clears throat> in light of this uh, tough environment in India, it is imperative that Indian entities look at the domestic transfer pricing world and develop their strategy for its compliance. We'll just get into what the legal provisions require. So the law says that all taxpayers with specified domestic transactions would need to compute its uh, uh, transaction value having regard to the arm's length principle. The kind of transactions which are covered include any expenditure incurred by way of payments to related entities. Uh, in case of entities which are enjoying tax incentives in India, either under the special economic zone or because they have undertakings or unit in special regions, uh, if there have been any intra-unit or intra-company transfer of goods uh, affecting those units, those will need to be computed in having regard to the arm's length principle and any other prescribed transaction. So far, no other specific transaction has been prescribed. The, tran the uh, 
specified domestic transactions, whether it is an expenditure or an income, would be affected by this uh, uh, by the regulations. Uh, having said that, uh, for units which do not have any sort of tax relief claim uh, and are only covered by domestic transfer pricing in relation to their payment transactions, the focus will be on the value of the expense which has been incurred uh, in payments to related entities. The regulations in terms of how to determine the arm's length price is very similar to what has been uh, provided uh, for the international uh, transactions and they require the arm's length price to be determined by one of the six methods, either the comparable uncontrolled price method, which really looks at the price comparison of a transaction. Uh, so it is uh, generally finding external data on uh, comparable prices is very difficult. And this method is commonly adopted where the unit has internal comparables. The second method is the resale price method, uh, which typically are used in the distributor uh, scenarios. Uh, in my experience, this method would be less commonly adopted for domestic transfer pricing transactions. The cost plus method, uh, which is typically adopted by service providers, it looks at the cost base of the service provider uh, and uh, the markup of what unrelated entities would charge on such cost base. The fourth method, which is the profit split method, uh, it, it's really used in transactions involving intangibles and looks at how the, uh, how the supply chain profits can be split amongst the participating entities based on their contributions. Uh, transactional net margin method looks at more of the profit indicators at the net level and it is uh, practically the more common adopted method uh, because the data which is generally available in the public domain would be margins of entities uh, uh, which are listed and that is the information which uh, we would typically adopt to test the arm's length standard. Uh, the other uh, interesting thing in the Indian context is the introduction of what is referred to as the other method. And this method is like a residuary method which provides that uh, you need to determine the arm's length price uh, with any form of data, uh, data which you would have based on which you could conclude what is the price to be charged uh, or has already been charged. Uh, so typically situations where we would rely on valuation reports uh, the valuation reports uh, could be construed to determine the arm's length price uh, under this category. The documentation requirements, again, for the domestic transfer pricing compliances is similar to the cross-border world. Uh, there is a set of mandatory documents which uh, the regulations prescribe. We have classified them into three categories. Documentation related to the company, uh, which is typically the ownership structure, profile of the entities or the units, the business of the entities, and the description of the industry in which the taxpayer is operating. Thereafter, we move to the transaction-specific documentation. And the transaction-specific documentation would include the nature, terms, and details of the specified domestic transaction, the functions performed, risks assumed, and the assets employed by the entities. Uh, and this is one uh, area which uh, could uh, pose a certain challenges uh, because when you're looking at intra-unit transactions where you have two divisions within the same legal entity, how do you demarcate the functions, risks, and assets? The price assumptions, policies, and negotiations entailing that pricing, uh, which would be important to document, especially in the context of services uh, which are procured uh, from common service providers affecting two divisions of the same entity. The economic and market analysis, forecasts, budgets, or any other financial estimates which could have a bearing on the transaction. Uh, then we move on to determining the actual arm's length price. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, this will have to be uh, determined having regard to one of the six methods which we discussed. And the selection of the most appropriate method needs to be documented. Uh, as we move into uh, the subsequent stages of the presentation uh, and we look at the illustrations, we would discuss a little more on the choice of method. The recording of the workings carried out in terms of the comparability analysis and the adjustments of the, to the results of those comparable transactions will also have to be documented. So it's a fairly robust requirement of documentation uh, in line with international standards and uh, the, uh, alongside this, the law provides for supporting documentation 
which is optional uh, and if it goes to further substantiate the price assumptions or the pricing model it would be recommended to uh, provide that as part of the uh, taxpayer documentation One of the peculiar features in the Indian context uh, compared to international transfer pricing regulations is the mandatory need to obtain an independent accountant certificate uh, which needs to be filed annually along with the return of income. And this certificate would also need to be obtained in relation to the specified domestic transactions. Uh, it requires a chartered accountant, uh, an equivalent of a certified public accountant overseas, to provide a report which is a true and correct report certifying that the documentation prescribed by law has been maintained by the taxpayer and the disclosures required in the form are accurate. The form uh, has been prescribed and the disclosures uh, would entail the name of the entities, the nature of the transaction, the value as recorded in the books, the arm's length price which has been determined and the method which has been adopted to determine that arm's length price. So this is really a report based on which the tax authorities would select cases for scrutiny and uh, the actual documentation would be provided subsequently during scrutiny. Another important development this year is that these reports would need to be e-filed as per the procedure prescribed by law. And the due date for all taxpayers who have uh, to comply with the transfer pricing regulations would be 30th of November. So for the financial year ended March 2013, the due date would be 30th November 2013. So that was a quick overview of the legal requirements uh, in relation to the domestic transfer pricing. Uh, we'll now get into a few more details and look at it uh, from, a ta from the industry's perspective, how they could look at managing their compliances and what issues could arise in the process. So prior to the introduction of these regulations, uh, the concept which was prevalent for most of these intra-group transactions in the domestic scenario was that of fair market value. Now, this concept of fair market value would be limited to transactions which aggregate to less than 5 crores or $1 million approximately. And the concept of ALP would apply to transactions which aggregate value more than 5 crores. The real difference between fair market value and arm's length price is really in the scientific approach. While the arm's length price has an approach which has been outlined in law and you need to determine it based on one of the six methods, uh, and supported with the documentation requirements. In the context of fair market value, there is no uh, proactive documentation to be produced. However, during scrutiny, if the tax authorities believe that on account of a uh, price which is biased, uh, the taxable income has been reduced, they have the powers to put the onus on the tax payer to prove that their transaction value satisfies the fair market value. A fair market value in concept would mean a price charged uh, in the open market and it could be any form of price in a particular scenario uh, and again need not go through the scientific approach which the arm's length price determination requires. Uh, from an assessment point of view also or from a scrutiny perspective, the tax authorities, uh, their specialized officers who would look at situations where uh, the price needs to be determined having regard to the arm's length price. Strategic decision points to be kept in mind when we're looking at the domestic transfer pricing is at two stages. Uh, stage one is when we're looking at setting the prices for the transactions and that would need a proactive review. Uh, while we are establishing pricing for either intra-unit transactions or uh, transactions between Indian group entities, it's important to factor the risks of double taxation because uh, we are really looking at the expense transactions uh, for the non-tax uh, relief entities. 
uh, and in that situation, uh, if the expense is construed to be unreasonable or excessive, the transpriising adjustment would be ha in the hands of the tax payer, the payer entity, and there would be no corresponding adjustment or relief for the recipient entity. Which means that if there was a transaction between two group entities, let's say there was a purchase of goods, and we valued that at hundred rupees, so party A pays hundred rupees to the group entity B. Uh, if hundred was construed to be unreasonable and the arm's length price was let's say ninety, then the income of A would be recomputed having regard to ninety, which means the income is increased by ten. Uh, however, there would be no corresponding adjustment or reduction of the value when you're computing the income of B. So the risk of double taxation is a very significant issue, uh, and the lack of the correlative or corresponding adjustment on this makes it imperative for a proactive review of this uh, of the prices of intergroup transactions the other important uh, aspect while setting these prices would be the impact on indirect taxes uh, in the indian context this would comprise of value added taxes and service tax uh, these uh, and even customs duty in case of import transaction there are certain scenarios where even import transactions though not covered by international transfer pricing could be covered in the domestic uh, regulations and the impact on indirect tax would arise because these uh, law these tax laws also have valuation methodologies prescribed and finally it needs to factor in the group's effective tax cost whether uh, uh, you know tactically you would like to uh, construe a price which would reduce the effective tax cost of the group and yet be compliant with the arm's length principle from a price checking perspective it's really your testing post facto whether the transactions which have been entered into comply with the arm's length principle at this stage uh, the taxpayer needs to look at in case it he has not complied the transaction value has not is not in compliance with the arm's length price whether he would like to make an adjustment prior to the closure of the books and therefore renegotiate the price of the transaction with the group entity or if the books have been closed then he will have to consider making an adjustment in the tax return now this would be outside the books and it's a tax payer initiated adjustment and again the consequence of this would be potential double taxation and again uh, if the pricing is different uh, whether you could claim a relief for the indirect taxes or the indirect tax authorities could look otherwise would continue to be an issue uh, this it is very important that we look at the price setting and price checking as independent phases of a transfer pricing management any questions so far the consequences of non compliance is very stringent one of the most uh, stringent regulations you would see globally uh, if the transactions are not uh, compliant with the arm's length price it could trigger additional taxable income in the hands of the taxpayer the differential amount could be construed to be as concealment of income triggering penal exposures as high as 300% of the tax if the prescribed information and documentation has not been maintained by the taxpayer then there's a penalty of 2% of the transaction value uh, uh again during a scrutiny if the documentation is requested and that is not provided there would be an additional penalty of 2% if the chartered accountant's report has not been filed within the due date there's a penalty of uh, $2000 approximately and uh, there's an additional penalty of 2% of the transaction value if any particular transaction has not been reported uh given the onerous uh, uh penal consequences it is recommended that in the chartered accountant's report if there is an ambiguity on the on whether a transaction is covered by the transfer pricing regulations or not at least a note uh, disclosing the same uh, would be recommended to mitigate any potential penal consequences as we went through the background and the legislative overview and what decision points the taxpayer would have 
uh, it is obvious that there is a great element of subjectivity in these aspects. What in our mind is very critical while uh, approaching the issue of transpricing is identifying the business context. Uh, once the business context is identified and we design the pricing policy in light of the business context, uh, most of the justification of the arm's length principle would follow. Uh, so the key part of the approach is how do you identify the relevant business context, which is the stage where we would uh, have to engage in discussions with the operational uh, heads of organizations and understand the rationale behind the intra-group flow of services or goods and the way the price should be computed. How to design an appropriate transpricing system and arrange for its proper implementation is the second step. And as we go through the design, it, we look at the supply chain tax costs, uh, particularly the VAT and service tax implications. The stage four and five is really about the documentation and controversy management. If the first two blocks on the identifying the business context and designing the transpricing policy has, uh, which is aligned with the business context, if that part is done fairly robustly, we believe that the taxpayer would be in strong grounds to defend the pricing policy. Given that we just have 60 minutes uh, for this presentation, uh, my aim was to uh, quickly breeze uh, through the overview aspects and spend more time on the illustrations uh, uh, which would probably be impacting most of you uh, in the Indian context. Uh, I would be happy uh, if any particular fact patterns would like to be shared as a question uh, for the entire audience and uh, I'll take those questions in this part of my presentation. So one of the uh, issues which we believe uh, would impact uh, the taxpayers is that domestic transpricing regulations are not limited to only transactions within India. In certain situations, it could also cover cross-border transactions. The reason being that the domestic transactions uh, apply to transactions between related parties, which is a, a category which is different from associated enterprises. So typically, if uh, a foreign company had an investment of, let's say, equity investment in an Indian company of 22%, he, could, he would not be covered by the transpricing regulations uh, uh, earlier uh, because the threshold was 26% equity holding. However, he would qualify as a related party. So the foreign company and the Indian entity would qualify as related parties and therefore now need to comply with transpricing regulations. The definition of related party is fairly broad uh, and it, uh, uh, it covers situations involving relatives of directors or other entities in which directors of a company could have substantial interest. It's very important to look at which entities qualify as related party and though they are not necessarily in India, if there have been transactions with those entities, they would be covered uh, by the ambit of domestic transfer pricing. We have already discussed the risks of double taxation. Another situation uh, which we believe would impact uh, quite a few multinationals operating in India. Uh, so we've just illustrated that in the form of a case study. Uh, Indian, there's an Indian company which is a subsidiary of a foreign company and it's operating, let's say, under a cost plus markup model and it's providing services. So it's like a captive center. Over the years, given how the growth of the Indian entity has been and also the tax relief provisions, they have organized their business into two independent business units. Uh, one unit is operating, let's say, from a special economic zone and therefore claiming tax reliefs. And the other unit is, uh, uh, is operating as uh, sort of the tax holiday has expired and they are now a taxable unit, which is referred to as non-eligible unit. There are common costs incurred by Indian company which have been allocated between the units. Uh, the taxpayer has uh, conducted a benchmarking study to test the price of the transactions which Indian company provides to the foreign company. And based on the comparable companies, let's assume that the arithmetic mean margin, which was arrived at, is 15%. Uh, so given that the international transaction was conducted at 18%, which is higher than 15%, it would be reasonable from an Indian perspective to conclude 
that the transaction satisfies the arm's length principle. However, in this situation, the authorities can they thereafter claim that the common cost which have been allocated does not comply with the arm's length principle and that is the reason why the eligible unit earns a margin of 18% while it should have earned a margin of only 15%. This conflict, uh, there is no clear answer on it uh, and our recommendation on this issue uh, is really that when you look at common cost allocation, you try and adopt a method which is not margin based and you satisfy those, uh, the price of those transactions with an independent method. However, the way the regulations currently read, uh, these conflicts underlie them and this could be a critical issue which quite a few multinationals uh, operating in India could face. Now I'm getting into a few specific transaction items and looking at how the transpriising regulations would be applied to them. So uh, situation one, uh, let's look at uh, uh, again an eligible unit which is claiming tax reliefs in India and a non-eligible unit which is uh, either the tax holiday has expired or they were never entitled to any tax reliefs. If there are transfer of goods and services between these two units, uh, the regulations require that the profits uh, which are earned by the eligible unit uh, are based on uh, the arm's length principle and they really look at whether these goods or services which are moving from the non-eligible unit to the eligible unit or vice versa comply with the arm's length principle. This would trigger if the value of the transactions exceeds uh, rupees 5 crores. In this situation, uh, we would look, need to analyze both the units, look at which unit has lesser complexities in the supply chain and use that as the tested party to see if the margins earned by that unit could be substantiated to comply with the arm's length principle. Uh, obviously, if that unit is selling goods to other unrelated entities or purchasing the similar goods from other unrelated entities, the adopting the comparable uncontrolled price method as the most appropriate method would be uh, the preferred route. So we, we, we believe in our experience that uh, most of these transactions uh, would need to be analyzed either using the CUP method or the transactional net margin method. And uh, their, uh, the, support, uh, the supporting documentation requirements would entail also trying to gather the invoices of the unrelated party transaction. The second transaction fact pattern which we're looking at is the purchase of raw materials, semi-finished or finished goods. Uh, you could use the tested party as either the payer entity or the selling entity. And again, uh, you know, you could use the cup method, but the cup method would generally be feasible to apply only in a situation where uh, similar goods have been procured from unrelated parties or sold to unrelated parties. Uh, and uh, if the CUP data is not available, then we would need to look at external benchmarking. Uh, the external benchmarking would uh, typically entail a profit-based analysis. Uh, now, the, the issues which we believe would arise when we are applying the external benchmarking approach is that we are really testing the margins of a particular unit with, uh, uh, with comparables who are much larger and would comprise a business model which is reflected at an entity level. Uh, while the regulations say that you need to look at each unit as a separate enterprise, practically the way businesses are organized, it's very difficult to dis, uh, distinctly identify all functions, risks and assets between the units or at a unit level or a division level. So uh, those will be the challenges which uh, we foresee uh, uh, while uh, uh, make, going through the analysis. Another common transaction which we come across uh, in, uh, in a lot of Indian companies is sharing of office space and the rental payments which one related entity would make to the other would qualify as a specified domestic transaction. In this situation, uh, we would recommend uh, trying to evaluate the transaction from the payer entity's perspective and look at whether the CUP or any other method can be applied. Uh, and uh, the other method would be limited to some kind of an information which operates at a price level. Uh, for rental payments, uh, it would not be very appropriate to look at a margin-based analysis. Uh, 
uh, and I'm assuming these are not real estate companies. These are companies uh, where the rental payments are not the primary cost of the uh, ventures. Uh, so we should look for rental charges to unrelated entities. Uh, there is fair market value guidance available uh, under regulations, which could be uh, a useful uh, benchmark. Uh, we could obtain quotations from real estate agents, etc., of what are the rental charges in the vicinity. The rental agreements, invoices, uh, copies of the quotations, uh, and the allocation workings would be the kind of supporting documentation which we would need to maintain uh, in order to substantiate what these related uh, rental payments uh, uh, comply with the ALP or not. The other transactions is of service charges where uh, group entities procure services from centralized units and uh, in this situation uh, we believe that using the service provider as the tested party and substantiating that the margins earned by that entity are comparable with unrelated entities would be an appropriate approach. Uh, it is very important in uh, service transactions to look at the allocation workings, uh, have in agreements to substantiate that this was always intended to be uh, operating uh, for the for, for a list of benefits because substantiation of the benefit test in the hands of the payer entity is going to be one of the areas where the tax authorities uh, are going to challenge the most. We have seen this in the cross-border scenario where the tax authorities have challenged uh, transactions involving payment of management fee, royalty, uh, and other common uh, like IT support costs, etc., where they have challenged saying that please prove uh, whether the taxpayer has actually received any benefit out of those transactions. Uh, what we've seen practically in scrutinies, uh, the, what kind of documents go to substantiate that the Indian entity has received a benefit is, uh, you know, in case of IT support and uh, management fee kind of transactions, we actually at times produce, uh, you know, huge box files of email correspondences to show the level of support which is being provided by the overseas entity. Similar documentation uh, may be required during scrutiny of domestic transactions. The other transaction which is very likely to arise in large intergroup uh, environments is the reimbursement of expenses uh, where either one unit or a related entity incurs the cost uh, on behalf of the other entity. Uh, the most appropriate method in most scenarios in our mind would be the cup method uh, and the cup method uh, which backs the price which has been paid to the third party and the fact that there is no markup uh, in the price which is charged uh, by the, uh, 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 there's no markup in the price charged to the payer entity. Again, allocation workings, agreements, benefit test, substantiation are critical. In some situations where the reimbursements are voluminous and organizing uh, every invoice, every supporting document uh, could be difficult, it is recommended that we obtain auditor certificates uh, to substantiate that these have been tested and there are no markups. So as part of the price setting and the regular reviews, having a third party certify that these transactions have been charged only at cost would be a very useful approach to reduce transurprising risks. We are also expecting the tax authorities to look at the previous assessments or previous scrutinies of the taxpayer to see whether these expenses were, uh, you know, incurred in uh, for business requirements and uh, has the trend been very similar to earlier years. So uh, some historical information on these expense reimbursements uh, is something which we should factor while uh, completing the documentation. The other very uh, common transactions between group entities would be of financing and interest charge on that uh, uh, is something which uh, is typically done uh, in order, which would happen even in unrelated party situations. And the rate charged in those loan transactions uh, would be critical. Now, the challenges here are that how do you substantiate that the interest rate uh, complies the arm's length principle because uh, typically interest setting would require information about credit terms, the risks associated uh, with the transaction, and especially if you're looking at financing within the group, uh, you would typically assume that the risks are lower than what third-party situations would be. The 
uh, advantage in the domestic transferizing context would be that uh, between group entities, uh, most likely these, these transactions would be covered uh, only for the peer entity. And as far as the peer entity can show that the interest they are paying is lesser than what third parties would charge, we believe that it should be sufficient compliance. Related to this financing transaction is the uh, corporate guarantee commissions. And uh, again, the benchmark here would be the commission charged by a bank for providing the guarantee. If there are markups on that commission, it, uh, you know, those poses challenges in terms of how would we substantiate. These financing transactions would uh, pose further ambiguities and issues, particularly if the, if they, uh, are, uh, uh, if the units which are uh, having these transactions are enjoying the tax holiday. Uh, what we have seen in most situations uh, is that units claiming tax reliefs are generally debt-free and uh, they claim the uh, relief for the pre-interest profits. Uh, so we are hoping that uh, this would not really impact the business uh, significantly uh, given that the probability of these transactions for such units would be lower. So I have a few questions uh, coming up, uh, which I'll take uh, slightly towards uh, the end of the uh, uh, presentation. One of the most peculiar transactions covered by domestic transfer pricing, which I think the professionals at large are quite confused as to how we would substantiate the arm's length principle, is the payment made to directors. The way the regulations have been worded, uh, it would cover uh, transactions of salary remuneration payments to the directors as uh, specified domestic transactions. At this stage, we believe that uh, the most uh, likely approach would be to look at the payer entity and look at their internal compensation policies and survey reports to see whether the, uh, val uh, whether the remuneration paid to the director is at par with what has been paid to the other employees of the organization. However, in the real world, uh, you, you know, there's a lot of peculiar situations and in family-owned businesses, that would really not be the benchmark uh, based on which the management would have decided on the compensation. Uh, in this regard, it's very important that uh, while uh, going through the uh, remuneration transactions, we look at having in, uh, contracts with the directors we have minutes of board meetings where other independent directors are available who have approved the remuneration. Uh, it would be useful to try and have a basis for arriving at the amount. Uh, if it's an ad hoc amount, uh, we are afraid that to substantiate it would be difficult. Uh, describing the role of the director, uh, whether the director is merely an independent director or he's a managing director or an employee director, these are aspects which would be very important to document. Uh, in, some, in quite a few situations, the corporate law requires the remuneration to be within prescribed limits and uh, they are approved by the central government in certain situations. So as far as it's within the prescribed limits, uh, one of the arguments is that given that it's already within a prescribed regulatory limit, it satisfies the arm's length principle. Having said that, uh, we believe that the tax authorities are likely to contest that view uh, given our experience uh, in the cross-border world where this argument was taken uh, in the context of royalty transactions. A few years back, India had uh, prescribed uh, limits for royalty payouts under the exchange control regulations. And the taxpayer's argument was that given that the royalty percentage is lower than the prescribed limit, it satisfies the arm's length principle. So let's say that the percentage prescribed in law is 3% and we uh, paid a royalty of 1%, since one is within the range provided by the exchange control regulations, it was argued that it is compliant with arm's length. However, the tax authorities have argued that whether 1% also is the right price. 1% also could be excessive or unreasonable, uh, either because there is no benefit with the Indian parties have received, that is one of the primary arguments, or that the benchmark could be lower than 1%. So similar arguments could arise in case of director remuneration. Uh, 
uh, we are hoping that there will be some clarifications which the tax authorities provide in this uh, uh, in this context. So these are some of the illustrations uh, which uh, we thought would be useful to share with the audience. Uh, now I'll just go on to answering a few questions uh, before we move towards the concluding slide. Uh, one of the questions asked is, uh, would transactions between an Indian company and its 50% foreign entity shareholder be considered as third party transactions or as related party transactions? Uh, if an Indian company uh, has a transaction with its 50% foreign uh, Sorry, if I understand the question right, it is the foreign company owns 50% of the stake in the Indian company and whether the transaction between these two entities would qualify as related party transactions. Uh, so the answer is that this would be covered by the international transactions. So it was always uh, uh, covered by Indian transferring regulations because the Indian entity and the foreign entity would be construed as associated enterprises. So the domestic transfer pricing regime would not apply in this situation and it's the uh, existing international uh, transfer pricing regime which applies for international transactions which would continue to apply. Just to clarify further, from a methodology and a documentation perspective, there is hardly any difference uh, uh, or there is no difference uh, in the way we approach international transactions or we approach domestic transactions. Uh, the real important piece is where a company not only has international transactions, but also has specified domestic transactions. In those situations, how do we design the approach? Uh, because let's assume like uh, a case where uh, a foreign company has an Indian entity and the Indian entity is in a special economic zone enjoying tax holiday. Now, if they're operating, let's say at cost plus 18%, like my earlier example, and the comparables give a benchmark of 15%. So because it's an international transaction, it would not qualify as a domestic transaction. And since the margin of the Indian entity is higher than the comparables, we would conclude that it satisfies the arm's length standard from an Indian perspective. Uh, so in this situation, really, uh, the domestic transfer pricing reg uh, regulations would not trigger. Now, having said that, on the domestic side, there, uh, given that it's a tax, uh, it's a unit enjoying tax holiday, there is a provision which says that the unit should not be earning more than ordinary profits. They should not design their transactions in a manner that they are earning more than ordinary profits because they have uh, arranged their uh, transactions to negate or claim higher reliefs in India, negate taxes or claim higher reliefs in India. In that situation, the domestic transfer pricing regulations would trigger and say that since 15% uh, is the ALP, the incremental 3% would not be eligible for tax relief. Uh, our view in this situation is that given that the transaction is already an international transaction, it would not qualify as a domestic transaction and therefore this risk would not exist. However, if there are multiple units in India, the transactions within those units would qualify as domestic transactions and would need to comply with the arm's length requirements. Hope that answers your question, uh, Eric. Uh, in case there's anything further you'd like on that, please feel free to uh, put it in the Q&A window. The next question, uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, the question is whether the classification of items below and above the gross margin level by the comparables, would it be consistent with the, uh, uh, with the classification used by the taxpayer, uh, particularly if you're looking at applying the cost plus method? Uh, this is an issue, uh, especially for service provider entities. Uh, in the Indian context, uh, when you look at the financials, uh, there is the gross margin is not distinctly disclosed by all entities and the classification of gross margin itself could be different. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why the cost plus method is less commonly adopted and generally taxpayers would move towards the net margin level uh, because the net margins uh, would take care of the accounting classification inconsistencies, if any. Uh, so 
Yes, I mean the answer to the question is basically that is yes, the classification of items would make a difference, and if that classification is very apparent, then uh, you could make some accounting adjustments and apply the cost plus method. But in practical experience, uh, we find that very difficult, and therefore we prefer the net margin method to the cost plus method. The next uh, question is, up to what value TP is not applicable? Uh, so, uh, like I said, the domestic transfer pricing, so if you're looking at transactions which are covered as specified domestic transactions, uh, which could be uh, transactions between Indian group entities, and if the value of that is less than 5 crores, then the transfer pricing regulations would not apply. Uh, having said that, you should note that even in those situations, you have to substantiate that the value complies with the fair market value theory. So though you do not need to formally maintain documentation and file a chartered accountant's report, uh, in, in a scrutiny situation, you would need to substantiate the price. Uh, so if it's less than 5 crores, domestic transfer, transfer pricing would not apply. The next question I have is, uh, does donation being paid to related party attract tran domestic transfer pricing? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, it's a donation, so I don't know how you will determine the arm's length price. Uh, but given that the payment uh, is to a related entity, it would trigger domestic transfer pricing. Uh, the, uh, we would need to get into the facts as to why do you need to share a donation with a related party. And uh, the other important point is, in a lot of situations, we've seen that the taxpayer actually cannot claim a deduction for the donation because it may not be a business expenditure. So if it is not a business expenditure, we could take an argument that really the price of that transaction doesn't matter since we are anyway not claiming a deduction while computing the taxable income. Uh, yeah, but the legal reading of the provisions, if a donation is given to a related party, transfer pricing would apply. Uh, any more questions? Uh, there is one question uh, which I think I will revert uh, separately. Uh, I do not know the answer offhand. The question is, if a director of a company is also a trustee of a trust, will payments made to the trust by the company be covered by uh, domestic transfer pricing? Uh, I'll just need to analyze this in a little more detail. Uh, prima facie, my view is that this may not uh, be covered uh, within the definition of relatives. Uh, or uh, entities in which substantial interest exists. Uh, but however, uh, uh, if you could share further details uh, by email to me. Uh, so this is a question asked by Nishant Shah. So if you could share uh, further details on that, I'll be happy to revert. towards the uh, sort of final uh, slide of uh, today's discussion. Um, as we 
subjective area and some of the peculiar situations uh, to which uh, the domestic transfer pricing regulations apply, it's very important to acknowledge and aim for a most proximate position. Uh, at times, we do get carried away with uh, certain scenarios which appear irrational, but we need to keep in mind that the penal consequences of these regulations are very harsh, and it's important that we ensure uh, appropriate compliances. Also, in terms of substantiating the arm's length principle, it's very important to acknowledge that transfer pricing is not merely a law, but it also entails the economic theories. And similarly, it's not merely an art, and therefore we need to look at an objective approach uh, which would be used to help in defense. The way to look at uh, complying with this uh, requirement in the Indian context, uh, to start with, we should conduct a diagnostic review of all the group entities, look at their profiles and the intergroup transactions. Uh, so we first make a list of which are the transactions which qualify as specified domestic transactions and therefore trigger the application of these regulations. Uh, we then look at conducting a functional analysis wherein we would document the business context and the roles uh, which are played by the respective entities for that transaction and organize evidence uh, for those roles which we have described. Then we move on to the economic analysis where we need to select one of the methods uh, which have, uh, out of the six which have been prescribed and also document as to why we are choosing one met a particular method for a particular transaction. Finally, we build a documentation folder <coughs> and provide a mapping with the compliances with the prescribed documentation requirements, based on which we would approach a chartered accountant to organize the certification which needs to be filed with the return of income. So these, this would be a very simple sort of summary of what needs to be done. Uh, we have a few more questions coming up. Uh, we have about five to seven minutes left. So I'll just take a few more. Uh, just give me a minute. So the question asks is, uh, a holding company registered in Mauritius has a 75% holding in the Indian microfinance company, and which method uh, would be useful? Uh, the method would be determined on what is the transaction between the two entities, and this would be covered by the cross-border transfer pricing regulations. Uh, so the uh, method I'm unable to answer because it depends on what is the transaction between the Mauritius company and the Indian company. The next uh, question which has come, Payment of rent to wife of managing director of a company, does it attract domestic transfer pricing? The answer is yes. Uh, being a relative of a director, the transaction would be covered and uh, domestic transfer pricing regulations would apply. So that's it uh, from my side uh, on this presentation. Uh, uh, thank you for the patient hearing. And uh, the this presentation would be available on the TPA Global website. Uh, the website URL is www.tpa-global.com. And also, I'll be more than happy to take a one-on-one -on -one session uh, with any of the participants uh, to discuss their specific issues. You could drop me an email with your requirement, and we could set up uh, a, a time uh, for that discussion. So that's it uh, from my side. Thank you very much. And that brings uh, us uh, towards the end of this uh, presentation. Thank you all.